Hi, and welcome to Chapter 18. In Chapter 18, we're going to cover how to design and install a new network. We're also going to cover some migration options. Let's get started. As you can see from our roadmap, we're almost done. This is the last chapter before the practice test. You've done a great job so far. When you want to start a new network, the first thing you always need to do is come up with your needs assessment. Needs assessment and design is going to cover what do you need to know? What are the needs of your situation in your specific office building, in your specific um, company that you're working at? There is a long list of questions to consider when designing the network, but they kind of break down into your physical, your security, application, organizational, and then fault tolerance. We're going to cover four of those on this slide and then talk about organizational on the next slide. So this slide, we're going to talk about the physical network structure. How many users do you have? What's the layout of the actual building? And how are you going to put those devices in the building? What types of devices are you going to be are using? And be very aware of the costs. Some devices, maybe generic, are going to be less expensive, but may not be as reliable. Some may be more expensive, but are stronger and do more of what you need in the case that you're going to grow. So keep an eye on the physical aspects of your network. What types of resources are you going to need? Obviously, internet. Are you going to need remote access? How are you going to be doing those? Are you going to use wireless or are you going to use wired? How is your network going to be connected? All of those things we've talked about through this entire course are all going to come together now in your physical network structure. You want to think about the security of your network. How are you going to set up your firewall? What other security procedures are you going to use? And please make sure you document them. Write them down. Make sure people understand. Is there going to be a, be a VPN? Are you going to have passwords and sh network shares? How are those going to handle things? And your encryption options. Make sure you understand the level of security required for your industry. You'll find in the real world some industries require a huge amount more security than others. Keep those in mind when designing your needs assessment. If your company does not need the best and brightest of all of your security options, you may not be worth the cost to implement those. Think about the different applications that your users are going to use. Most of them are going to need some version of Office 365, something like that. But they may also have other requirements. Databases. Do you need a database server? AutoCAD. Do you need large amounts of graphic processing? Depending on the situation, some of these will be important and some won't. Can you get away with small little three, four hundred dollar laptops, or do you need something more significant for whatever your users are using? We also need to think about your fault tolerance and your data integrity. Are you going to choose to use RAID drives? Are you going to choose to use cloud services or mirroring? How are you going to set up your users storing their data? Are they going to store them on a local hard drive, or is there going to be some sort of backup? Think about power options. Do you need to install a UPS in each of your offices, or are you going to have a, a central generator that is going to allow you to have power in the case of power failures? Think about these kind of things early. When you start designing the layout, how are you going to implement these? All of these questions are important to consider anytime you start a new network. As you're designing your network, you're going to want to think about your organizational structure. How are you going to be setting up the actual organization of your directories? Are you going to define your naming conventions? How are you going to be doing that? Where are you going to be doing your servers, the location? And how are you planning on partitioning your drives? Things like this, you often think about after the fact, but they're great to do at the beginning. If you answer these questions early, you'll already know the answer when it's time to ask the questions. How are you planning on setting up your TCP IP? Most networks are going to use TCP IP. So are you using static IP addresses or DHCP? How big is your address pool need to be? Are you doing web hosting? Are you using cloud services? Are you planning on subnetting? Think about these things that you've learned over the last eight weeks to figure out how you're going to set up your TCP IC services. Which types of servers are you going to use? And there's just a list of them here. Application servers, DHCP, DNS, file, database, firewalls, mail servers, radius servers, SQL servers, web servers. Do you want to have a single server for each of these? Or do you want to have a server doing multiple things? 
you can have your database and your web server running off the same machine. As long as they're not overloaded, that's not a problem. If they are overloaded, it can be a problem. Think about these kind of things. If your web server is going to be doing connections back to your database, it might be really efficient. If you want to keep them separate so nothing from your website can actually hit your database and change your actual data, you may want to keep them separate. The last section of your design at this point is going to be how do you want to set up your directory. Most systems are going to use some version of LDAP, whether it's going to be Active Directory or Open LDAP or Sun's One Integrated Server, they all use a version of the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Figure out which one you want to use. If you're going to use Active Directory, using Microsoft, IBM, so on and so forth. The naming conventions are really important to keep track of. When you design your system, document your abbreviation choices, document your naming conventions. Your naming conventions would be things like devices should not be related specifically to a person in the off chance that that person leaves and you still have the device left over. Don't call it John's laptop if you're going to give it to Mary later. Usernames. You can use full names or initials if you choose to do J. Smith or John Smith. Just remember there could always be duplication. Be aware of duplications. If you want to abbreviate things as in which department, accounting versus AR, um, HR, if you want to have workstations numbered, these kind of things, think about it in terms of how do I prevent duplications and make this identification be something useful. I don't want to just call it one, two, three, four, five. That's not going to help me to understand what's going on. So think about your naming conventions of what you're going to do in your just directory structure. The basic LDAP structure is listed here where we have our root, then we break down into country, then organization, then organizational unit, and all the way down to our objects. This is your basic LDAP directory structure. You also want to think about how you're going to partition your drives or your volumes. If you're going to be having RAID drives or if you're going to be having basic hard drives, how do you want that partition to work? The example down here in green gives you workstation 12 in the accounting department in the H building in room 302. If I just had 302, what if there is a J building that also has a 302? How do I differentiate if it's also in the accounting department? Do I need to have the accounting department and the building, or is it already obvious because all of accounting is in the same building? So I could just say accounting 302 and that would tell me. Different abbreviations need to be documented and understood and being able to be used consistently through your system. There are design tools that you can use. Some help more than others, depending on the situation that you have. In Microsoft's planning tools, there are um, there is the infrastructure planning and design guide series that is in the Solution Accelerators part of the TechNet website. This is a planning and design guide series of questions and books and, and software that you can use. The Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit, the MAP Toolkit, is free downloadable from Microsoft. You can just go to their website and look for Map Toolkit. And it allows you to survey your existing network and inventory all of the virtual and non-virtual computers and servers. If you have no actual documentation, you walk into a room and they say, we need you to document our network. You can go down and get this toolkit and then run it on the network and it will walk through and survey everything that exists already and be able to document it for you. You can then use that to help you to break down what is it you need to do at this point. Visio is a Microsoft product that's able to be used for graphing, charting, flow charting, things like this with visual tools. It can be really useful to help you to draw out your network. Network view is designed to identify your TCP IP nodes in your network, your DNS, your SMP, your TCP ports, and all of your MAC addresses. The visual here, the image that's on top, is your network view. And this helps you to design that logical um, view of your network. Not the physical, it doesn't tell you where the devices are in the building, but it does tell you how they are logically connected. When you're ready to start the installation process of your new network, most important thing to do, first thing, is develop your timeline. You're going to build a chronological list of what's going on from start to finish, organizing, designing, installing, implementing, documenting, and training. Six steps. 
of, or five steps of everything that needs to be done to install your project. When you develop your, dot, your timeline, you're gonna to get together a group of people, usually a team. Sometimes you can do it all yourself. Um, depends on how big the network is. And you wanna think about how am I gonna do the installation? How long is that going to take? Do I need to order parts? Do I already have them in place? When I have those parts, I need to implement any of the software changes that I need to make. So installation, putting the hardware in place, um, documentation or in, uh, implementation to actually make sure that the software is all in place. Really important part about documentation. Yes, you should document everything. You should be drawing pictures, sketching out. What does the building look like? Where am I putting devices in the building? I always look at it as if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, can somebody else walk into your network and know all that you know? Can they read your documentation and figure it out? If for some reason you win the lottery and you decide I'm never going to work again, let's make something nicer than getting hit by a bus. How is the company going to be able to survive you leaving? Mitigation processes for that to make sure that they understand all the documentation and somebody else can walk in and take over. Your acceptable use policy is included in that documentation. How are you expecting your users to use their products? Are they allowed to use it for personal use? Is it only for business use? Is it only for specific directories or specific parts of your company? How are you documenting the acceptable use of your software? This is usually where you bring in that little thing about you can't look at certain websites using our, our hardware or our internet backbone. That goes into acceptable use policy. Finally, give yourself time to train your users. You need to give them some information. You need to help them to understand how things have changed now. Did you change the directory structure? Did you help them to find their printers or their, or their shared network drives? However you chose to do that. Give yourself time in your, in your timeline to train your users. By the way, this type of a timeline that's given here is called a Gantt chart, G-A-N-T-T, -T, two T's at the end. Um, named after the guy who came up with it, this style of breaking down time across the top, tasks down the side, and being able to see it in a visual sense. Microsoft has a Windows Automation Installation Kit, or the AIK, Automated, Automated Installation Kit, which actually will create a disk image with the operating system, the drivers, and the applications. It creates what we call an ideal clone of what computer you want. By building that clone, you can clone it onto multiple devices easily and quickly because it's a disk image. You can just take the new drive, the new computer out of the box, put this clone drive on there, it'll update everything, put the OS, the drivers, and the application all correctly, and then all of your devices will be consistent. Some of the parts of your physical design have already been explained to you. So these are going to be repeats of those but it's important and it's important for you to recognize how it goes. So we start from our internet, we go through our ISP, and the first thing we hit is our demarcation point. The demarcation point is that spot where your customer equipment meets the provider equipment. It has lots of names. It can be the point of presence, the point of entry, the customer connection point, service delivery point, or your demark point. This connection is where the, the ISP goes into your company. It's important that you have installation standards or specifications, shortened to specs, that are documented and actually followed. Especially when you get into electrical or any of the telecommunication, you have to follow the specifications or the standards that are for your industry. If you don't, you can be risking lawsuits or problems with connections if you didn't follow the standards. So it's really important that we try to follow those standards. Your network interface device, your, um, your NID, network interface device, is the device that connects the local loop with a jack or a smart jack. Remember, the smart jack adds in some power and it adds in some analysis that goes along with it. We can check things with the jack rather than it just being plugged in. If we have fiber instead of um, twisted pair, instead of cat cables, we need to use an optical network terminal or an ONT, optical fiber your ONT is going to be your network jack, your RJ45 version for a fiber connection, for a fiber optic termination point. Remember we have our main entrance room. 
Now the rooms at this point start to get a little confusing. Our main entrance room or our entrance facility is going to be the place where the telecommunication comes into the building. They can be the same place. They are the place where everything comes in and we have our network interface device or our optical network terminal. Those are gonna come in inside of our entrance facility. Inside this facility, the entrance or the main entrance room, we're also gonna have our main distribution frame, our MDF, where the cable connection is in the main entrance room. All of that's inside your main entrance room. Next, we have backbones, and the backbones can take us to our equipment rooms, telecommunication rooms, or telecommunication closets. What is the difference between them? Not a whole lot. So equipment room is a room that holds equipment. Telecommunication room is a place that holds telecommunication equipment, as opposed to all equipment. And telecommunication closet means that it's enclosed. It's usually more secure and it's inside of a, a very small room rather than a large room. You can have a telecommunication room that has the servers just kind of sitting there and you can have a closet that's a little bit more enclosed. So when you think of enclosed, think of a closet. Room is just where the telecommunication is or where your equipment is. This is where your servers are usually gonna hang or your patch panels. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those in just a second. After that, we move on to things like the work area with our horizontal wiring. We're gonna do that on um, the next slide. So when we look at our work area, that's gonna be where the employees actually do their job. There's usually a desk, there's usually a computer, and the people actually sit there. That's called a work area. When we connect from the work area to the closet or the telecommunication room, we call that horizontal wiring. There are sections of cable that run from the work area to the closet. We also have horizontal cross connects, which are going to be um, cabling that connects systems to other cables. So we're connecting not from a person or a work area to the closet, but from closet to closet or from section to section, horizontal cabling with other cables. So horizontal wiring from your work area. One of the things to remember with our horizontal wiring from our work area to our closet, is you should always have at least two outlets in any work area, one for your phone and one for data. So one for your voice and one that's a Cat5 or Cat6 cabling. Your backbones are kind of like horizontal cross connects, but they connect your telecommunication closet to your main entrance facility and or other equipment rooms. So your backbones are not going to any specific work area. Telecommunication room or closet are, again, enclosed spaces that house telecommunication equipment. That's kind of obvious. Remember when we talked about cable types and how far each of them could go? Our UTP and our STP, remember way back when, Chapter 2, when we talked about media for Cat5, Cat6, and then our, our fiber. There is a distance of how far they can go. Our UTP, our unshielded twisted pair, up to cat three or higher, so your usual cat five or six, um, can go 800 meters for your voice, but only 90 meters for your data. Keep those numbers in mind. With your shielded twisted pair, same thing, 800 meters and 90 meters. Your multimedia or multimode fiber can go 2,000 and your single mode can go 3,000 meters. So those can go a lot further if you're going to use fiber inside of your building or inside of multiple buildings. So keeping in mind that distance between the different category types is really important. If you're starting to run cable and you think about those meter lengths, make sure that you keep to those, to those specifications. In this screen, we're going to introduce you to patch panels. We've talked about them before. You know what they are. They're rack-mounted wiring devices for your network. The picture on the far right is going to be the RJ45 front of your patch panel. The picture up at the top is going to be the back. So you have RJ45s going in and connections in the back. Those connections use the IDC or Insulated Displacement Connector to connect those cables using a punch-down tool. So the punch down tool allows you to push cables in. It's going to splice the, the outer shielding to allow them to push in nicely and we can use that punch down tool to do that. That way you can have multiple cables all connected in nicely with RJ45s in the front to be able to connect them with a connector. 
this is your patch panel and most of your servers are going to server rooms are going to look like this for connecting the different devices into different locations obviously we have to refer to our different standards organizations you've heard about ANSI and TIA and EIA standards these are all the US standards we also have the Canadian standards which is the CSA or the European standard which is the International Organization of Standardization ISO that's the European standard Canadian standard and US standard they also use the National Electric Code or the NEC and we're going to talk about that on the next slide as well each of these different standards so the TIA EIA or the TSB standards that are listed down here break down based on different standards so ones for telecommunication pathways and spaces as opposed to the cabling so those are your TIA 569A's 568B's your administration standard so that's going to be your 606A and then your commercial building grounding and bonding requirements for telecommunication again if you are not a licensed journeyman or a licensed electrician you probably need to get some information on these before you bring up how to do these actual wirings make sure that you have permission and that you're following the right rules by the way the TSB 75 is an additional horizontal cabling so it's actually a supplement to the 568A standard so this is your TSB 75 as your supplement you can see the implication here where you have your building you have your equipment where you cross connect your wiring closet and how those are all grounded and connected together as we've talked about before there is an entire length issue for these cabling if you have a patch cable and horizontal wiring and patch cables to the device that entire length cannot be more than 100 meters you have to keep track of all three of them so they're listed down here in the in the image in the middle of three different points we are using what's called a multi-user telecommunication outlet assembly or a MUTOA which is a group of outlets that serve up to 12 work areas it's it's built it's a it's a connector kind of like a um, electrical panel that has 12 outlets in it so it's prefabricated in this case if you have your horizontal wiring that goes from your patch panel to your MUTOA and then from your MUTOA directly to the work areas you have limits on how much length you can do remember your patch cables those are the ones that are actually on your patch panel from one to the other are usually seven meters or less so we're going to assume that they're all seven meters for the purposes of this so if your patch cables on your patch panel are seven meters and your patch cables from your MUTOA over to your work area are different lengths they depend on the horizontal wiring between them to make sure that that length all three a b and c added together do not equal more than 100 meters usually we limit our horizontal wiring to groups of five meters um, so 90 85 80 8, 75 70 so we we'll break them down into five meter sections um, just by length I mean you could cut them specifically to length to make to make it work but if we assume that your patch cable C from your MUTOA to your work area is three meters the smallest that we could go, do there your patch cable on your patch panel is seven meters then your horizontal wiring cannot be more than 90. make sure that this math actually makes sense in your head these three different cables are going to add up to less than 100 meters if our horizontal wiring is 70 meters i can make my final patch cable my c up to 20 meters and it still works okay but it can't go more than that because the whole thing needs to be less than 100 meters all combined we can also use the concept of a consolation point which is where the horizontal wiring system feeds into the wall unit or the MUTOA so if we use the um, that location from our patch panel to the consolidation point and then from the consolidation point outlets to the different work areas that's what a consolidation point is it's a place where the horizontal wiring system feeds into the wall unit the image that's over on your right hand side here is just a sketch of what the office building looks like and then they've added partition walls with these MUTOAs attached to the back of them they allow the different users to be able to connect into them in an open office space environment 
Your National Electric Code, or your NEC, is hundreds and hundreds of pages of specifications for wire sizes and conduit sizes and supports and other types of materials. It's all the requirements and standards that you need for your network. All of the electrical work needs to be done by a licensed electrician or journeyman. Um, electrical work is really important that it be standardized and understood by someone who is licensed. If you are doing electrical work and you are not licensed, it can cause problems. Most of the telecommunication industry must be isolated from your higher voltages. And there's three different types of voltages listed here. Most telecommunication is less than 50 volts, so it's fine. It's signaling and communication. 50 to 600 volts is generally your residential commercial wiring. And then more than 600 volts is going to be your really high voltage. Again, electrical work really should be handled by a licensed electrician. The Building Industry Consulting Services International, or BICSI, is a worldwide nonprofit that is focused on educating skilled workers in telecommunication fields. That's its job. It's all about education and teaching you new things about the industry, making sure that you are prepared for what's required of you. All right, we made it to the end of Chapter 18. For this chapter, you've got your review questions, your study guide. There are only two lab activities, but I hope that you have a little bit of fun with these. Lab 91 is going to be design a small network. I want you to actually sketch these out. If you can use some sort of a graphical interface to be able to design it, you can use Draw.io or one of the online sources. If you have access to Visio, you can use Paint. You can even use Word or something like that to draw pictures. That's fine. Just design your network. You can use Packet Tracer and use screenshots from that as well. Make your network. Design it. Tell me the different pieces of information. The lab is going to walk you through different questions you need to ask. So that's going to be Lab 91. Lab 92 is going to be using Wireshark with sample files 18 and 19 to be able to establish your baselines, understanding which protocols are you using, what are the base peak and average times that you need. Go ahead and fill out the lab activities, get those submitted. Chapter 18 Study Made is available, and don't forget to take the quiz. Thanks for watching Chapter 18 on creating your own network. We're going to do a little video for Chapter 19, but Chapter 19 mostly will just cover preparation for the exam. So we're going to talk about different ways you can prep, different study options. We're almost done with the course, and we're ready to take that Network Plus exam. Have a great week.